Politics, business, and religion. We discuss the topics you avoid at the dinner table, bringing you the biggest names in Texas politics and beyond. This is the Trey Blocker Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. Today's special guest is Representative Drew Springer, Chairman of the House Agriculture Committee. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Trey. Great to be with you. Now, you are from Munster, Texas, and I suspect anybody who is not of German background doesn't even know how to spell that. That is correct. Okay, so how do you spell Munster? M-U-E-N-S-T-E-R. Okay, and for the uninitiated, where exactly is that? <laughs> so that is uh, I-35 in the Red River, north of, Dow uh, north of Dallas, Denton. Right before you get to Oklahoma, you hook a left for about 12 miles west and you're in Munster. Okay, and so I've heard some interesting statistics about your house district. So correct me if I'm wrong, one being it's the second largest district geographically. That's correct. Okay. And then there was something about if you were to compare it to another state or something? Yeah, it'd be the uh, 42nd biggest state, but more importantly, I'd be bigger than 74 other countries. <laughs> so uh, okay. you know, I know you've had Poncho Navarro's good friend. We came in right. together on, and uh, if you put Poncho and my district together, we have 25% of the land mass of the state of Texas. So is his the largest? His is the largest. Okay. I have more county, so I have 22. He has 18. But that Brewster County is like the size of six Correct. counties. Who has more cows? You uh, I definitely have more cows. <laughs> good. So from the western side of Dallas, how far west does it go and then how far north sure it goes all the way so you know basically north of denton there in gainesville runs all the way to the edge of lubbock uh so i have post uh rawls and floyd ada it goes up through uh memphis childress shamrock okay. wheeler up on oh, i-40 wow. okay. so about even with amarillo on the north end wraps back down to vernon and it just does a big circle around wichita falls okay do you have Turkey, Texas in your district? I do have Turkey, Texas. Right. Isn't Turkey where the Bob Wills Museum I is? I have given a speech on that <laughs> stage to the cattle raisers. That is so, a really yeah. neat place. Yeah, it is. Okay, so were you born and raised in that area? Not too far from it. I was born and raised in Weatherford. So okay. well, I should say raised in Weatherford. As, so I like to say I was born in Oklahoma in Tulsa. And at age three, I finally learned to talk and said, Mom and Dad, let's go to Texas. <laughs> so uh, we Perfect. came on down then. And so, but, you were uh, smart from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But uh, Weatherford was home not too far. Went to school in North Texas, and, you know, a little about 60 miles up and then about 60 miles over to Munster. So right. you know, a little triangle there. And where did you meet your wife, Lydia? Uh, I met her in Munster at okay. uh, the last weekend of April. They have the big German fest. Uh -huh. um, about 30,000 people come into a town of 1,500. Wow. And, uh, you know, matter where any good person did, right next to the beer garden. <laughs> and so, uh, did you have your lederhosen on? I did not have lederhosen <laughs> at that time. But uh, that's, uh, this April will be 30 years ago that we met. Congratulations. Thank that's you. a great milestone. Yeah. And three kids, four kids? Three kids, uh, 18, 20, and 24. Uh, one's already graduated college, the other two in it, and the one that's graduated uh, working on the well patch in West Texas and married. So Good, good. So you got a few more to get through college. i got a couple more to get through. Okay. So yeah, and, and then you get a pay raise. Then I'll get a pay raise. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Good. And so tell us about uh, your, your career trajectory after college. What'd so you, you after college, I went and worked for, with my father for about a year. Uh, met my wife, ended up chasing her over into the Dallas area, worked for uh, Trinity Industries, big rail car manufacturer, mm -hmm. 15 years there. Uh, had the opportunity to uh, start life as a staff accountant, uh, worked my way up to where I was w running three of their divisions. Um, but I was gone all the time, three young kids. Right. Uh, had the opportunity to go back to work with my father, worked for, did that. Worked for him for a little over 10 years, and then a couple years ago, went and uh, got into the tax consulting world. Right. Okay. So you, you and I share a passion that I fear we need to talk about, <clears throat> and that is surfing. Now, being Texas boys, it's not like there's a lot of great surf around, and so you and I have both been out to Inland Surf Park out by the airport here, which, right. which is a whole lot of fun. How did you get into surfing? I'm not sure I've ever asked you that. Yeah, you know, it, it was a weird deal. You know, we used to take vacation, you know, the, the two places we 
vacation when I grew up was Nuevo Laredo or Galveston. And so I remember trying to surf those little bitty baby waves in Galveston. Right. right. Uh, and, and so picked it up a little bit there, did some windsurfing out of uh, in college, uh, and just sort of, I've always enjoyed it. So it's yeah. always been fun playing around. I had a buddy at a old surfboard on the back of a you know outboard boat and we'd try to surf the wake and do that right. but before right. these ballast boats were even out well that reminds me you and i still have not coordinated with senator larry taylor on the tanker surfing that's thing. correct and we've got to do that that is definitely on my bucket list to be yeah. able to do a, let's a, wait till a five it minute wave yeah let's wait till it warms up a little bit yeah, yeah. it definitely would be a good choice but yeah we definitely need to do that that yeah. looks like a lot of fun and you're a big fisherman too I do. I like. I uh, love to fish. Um, you know, mainly bass fishing up at home. But I've, I've really, of late, um, have had the opportunity to go down to the coast and do some uh, trout and, and red fishing, uh, and just really enjoy it. It's from, a lot of fun. from kayaks, right? Yeah. My yeah. my wife. Um, you know, one of her passions is kayaking, and so she drags me along. And so I said, but I have ADHD, so I got to be doing something <laughs> else. So. Right. I found these Hobie Cat ones that you can step on, so it leaves my hands free, so yeah. I, I like to fish out of them, so right. it's a lot of fun. That's pretty cool. Um, so you are now in your fourth legislative session. Correct. Uh, and we are a little over 30 days into the session. What's your, what's your impression so far of how this session's going and how it might be different from previous sessions? You know, I think uh, one is everybody's focused on core functions of government and what's important to Texans. You know, it's um, school finance, it's property tax, and then it's just getting things right. I mean, we're talking more about why are people having to wait six hours in a driver's license line than talking about, you know, things that might affect two or three people. Right. And so, you know, from that standpoint, it's really good. And when you focus on those things, I think it's led into a kumbaya moment mm -hmm. uh, with the changing of speakers. Uh, the House is, is really united. Uh, Democrats, Republicans, all sides of the Republicans, and all sides of the Democrats, and we, and, I, and, and there's no secret we've we've got different groups within there, but everybody's sure. getting along, and I think that's it's led to a very good start, and so I'm looking forward to what we get done. I suspect with any new speaker, and I think this is my one, two, three, fourth speaker that I've I've seen since running around politics in Texas, and I assume there's a a, a honeymoon period that maybe lasts an entire first session for a speaker do you I think? think you'd be lucky to last the entire first session <laughs> okay. there will come a moment there is no doubt I mean look um, you know I, I talk about Poncho and I talk about Poncho in all my town halls because I said look 90% of what I do up here Poncho and I agree with because we're mm. rural Texas right even though he's a Democrat right but there still are a handful of partisan issues Guns don't even divide Poncho and I. We passed a gun bill together last session he likes to that shoot. helped Mossberg yeah. um, and so you know you know, so from that standpoint, but yes, will we get on to possibly, you know, a pro-life or a Second Amendment or, or one of those type of things? Yeah, there'll be those arguments, but that's mm -hmm. not going to be the center focus. It's not where we're going to spend all of our energy. We're going to spend our energy getting taxes right. We're going to spend our ener energy getting school right. Right. Well, one of the things I've always liked about Texas politics compared to D.C. politics is they spend all of their time and energy trying to tear down the other party. Yeah. Whereas legislators here spend most of their time trying to solve real problems. And yes, there are going to be arguments along the way, maybe some ruffled feathers mm -hmm. hurt feelings. But at the end of the day, am I wrong? You're all friends for the most part. Yeah, I mean, we all go back into the members' lounge. We all have coffee. We eat breakfast together. We talk about things. We, we visit each other's districts. Right. Um, yeah, there, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to find a couple members that just dislike each other. Mm -hmm. Sure, there are a few. <laughs> There's probably a few. And there might even be some on the, on each caucus's side that it, that right. might fall into that category. And, that's right. You know, and that's human and, nature. And, and sometimes, you know, look, the media sells eyeballs going to whatever they've got. Right. And, and so they love to talk about pro life fights on the floor rather than talking about us, you know, passing comprehensive CPS reform if we all agree on it. Sure. You know, so that, that's just the difference. You know, Jonathan Stickland and I get along fine. I consider him to be good friends. We talked, we were joking around uh, last week on a couple different issues. Did Jonathan and I see difference eye to eye on a couple issues that affected my district? Yeah, but 
those haven't carried on outside the floor to where it's like, oh, you know, now I won't work with him on mm-hmm. something else like red light cameras. We're talking red light cameras. Right. Uh, both of us hate them. So that's a good thing. I what think is the status on red light cameras these days? You know, I, it's an I, argument that's been around for a long time. It, it is. And uh, I, w- I was saddened to see the governor didn't make it a, an emergency <laughs> legislative <laughs> item. But, hey, he has weighed into it and says uh, he doesn't like them either. And so, right. um, you know, I'm hoping we might do something on those. Well, that would be good. So, you know, the last three or four sessions, five sessions, last decade maybe, uh, there's been a lot of tension between the House and Senate. Right. Even though the House has been Republican controlled and the Senate has been Republican mm-hmm. controlled, how do you see that dynamic playing out this session? You know, I think it's much improved. I mean, okay. look, I, 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 I had the pleasure of serving under Speaker Bonin on Ways and Means for two sessions. Mm-hmm. I saw how Speaker Bonin worked with Betton Court and Lieutenant Governor. Um, I know they have a great working relationship, and I think that you've seen that in some of their press conferences and the directions we're going. Right. Um, and, and I think you're seeing that from the Lieutenant Governor, sure. saying, "Hey, look, I'm I'm not going to try to run over the uh, the House on getting committees out way ahead of us." Right. We got ours out early, and I was glad to see that. Um, but I think that that working relationship, and then working with the Governor, I think those three are going to be, you know, making sure we're staying focused on those big items. And it would seem to me for solutions to be had on those big items, mm-hmm. the big three have to be working together. Don't, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. I think that's also our form of government and the checks and balances is, you know, if everybody's not agreeing with an issue, it's mm-hmm. not going to get done. It's, it's, right. You well know, it's, we tell everybody it's a lot easier to kill stuff and make sure stuff doesn't pass. Mm-hmm. And while some of us, if you're carrying it, you hate it. It's probably for the good of the state it works that way. Absolutely. Yeah, when we have uh, what close to 8,000 bills filed every mm-hmm. session, it's a good thing a majority of those die. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's exactly right. I mean, you know, and, and so we talk about those, and, and I've, I get made fun of because last session I filed more bills than any other Republican, and everybody goes, I thought you were for small government. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I'm filing bills that, you know, decriminalize your key fob. You know, things like that. It's like, hey, I'm trying to get bad bills off the books as much as passing new rules and regs. That's right. Just because you file a bill doesn't mean you're not trying to increase freedom as opposed to constrict freedom. That's correct. Right. So you are now the chairman of the House Ag Committee. What's going on in the ag world today, and how does that affect urban Texans? Well, you know, hopefully they want to continue to wear clothes and eat. And so that's the big thing that uh, ag oversees. And, you know, we want to make sure those things uh, continue on. Um, some of the big items in, that are discussed, and what I tell people is, you know, a lot of these have been worked out. Um, there's not just, nobody's trying to r- radically undo rural Texas in, in the ag community. And so, but you have clawbacks. So if you have ag land and you sell it, there's a five-year clawback. People want to address that. Right. It's going to be if one of the big things. If it's taken out of ag, ag If it's use. taken out of ag, you have right. a back use. I had a, a 92-year-old constituent who sold her farm that she'd grown up her whole life on. Um, You know, yes, it was only 30 acres. It just happened to be on the corner of I-35 and Highway 82. Mm. Neither of those two were there when she was born on that property. Wow. Um, And yet when she went to sell it to a QT, all of a sudden she's paying $200,000 in back taxes for the five-year clawback. So you've got that side of it. But then on the other side, you say, well, we also don't want developers to buy it, sit on it, and then not have any skin in the game, knowing that they can wait till the last moment. And maybe they're not Which using it to the best. And that's why it's there. Yeah. And so we're going to listen to those. Um, then even in ag, you have times are changing and different things are coming up. Uh, hemp is coming back and saying, you know, do we do hemp production? Mm. Uh, I actually was driving back uh, last night and listen to an hour's worth of testimony on hemp to get right. back up to speed on, you know, what are the arguments for and against it. And we're talking about industrial Industrial hemp. hemp. Right. This is non-zero to almost no THC. Right. So that's not really the issue that you're, you're doing it from that standpoint. I think a lot of it comes into, you know, research dollars and does, if we do do it, does it take away from cotton, corn, and cattle and other type of things that would be there? Well, let me, let me ask you this. <clears throat> If I'm a farmer, mm-hmm. shouldn't I be able to grow pretty much whatever I want? So if I want to 
take out my cotton production and grow hemp because maybe it's going to do better in my region. Maybe it's going to fetch more in the marketplace. Yeah. Why shouldn't I be, able, be allowed to do yeah, that? Yeah, and, and those arguments, I absolutely agree. And I think from the, the other side is we also have a finite amount of dollars. And do we want to pull, you know, you've also seen these where it's, I want to be free market, I want to do this, but the second I'm free, then I want to be subsidized. And so, <laughs> well, we now, don't need that, now, for sure. Now yeah. come in and do that aspect. And, right. and you can sit there and look, is it the cash crop that cotton is, you know, when you look at what it does for the United States and, and obviously Texas, mm -hmm. um, and going from that standpoint. And I think that's really where some of the discussions will be around to see if we go forward with it. Well, and I know this isn't, you're not chair of the Public Health Committee, but a closely related conversation, obviously, is cannabis. I don't think we're going to have any cannabis farms around Texas anytime soon. But as far as increased use for um, for epilepsy and, and pain yeah. management for veterans suffering, mm -hmm. suffering from PTSD, I mean, do you think that's going to make any progress? I hope so. I mean, I've been a huge fan of the right to try stuff. I mean, it was obviously the stem cell, I think, ties right in line right. that I argued for last session with Tan Parker. Right. Um, but look, if, if a doctor thinks CBD oil is going to help you with a medical condition, and that's a zero THC type of deal, I don't understand why we don't allow that to happen. Sure. Um, FDA is very, you know, it, it's very troublesome to, to see that and the things we have that prevent that. And I think we have that right to try, and we need to continue to push yeah, that. Absolutely. So everybody's talking about property taxes, and everybody complains about property mm -hmm. taxes. I know you're work, working on a bill. Yep. You want to tell us about it? Sure. I mean, you know, one is, you know, I think that SB2, HB2, um, picks up right where we left off last session, improves it, continues to build upon it. If you don't have reform, you don't have transparency, you don't have taxpayers knowing who they need to go argue with. Right. I've always said I'm the appraisal district's best friend because that's not who you go argue about that your taxes are too high. That's who you go argue with if the value's wrong. Mm -hmm. So you have to have that on. But at the same time, we all know that people are screaming for relief. That's right. And, you know, we've gone from a decade to two decades of seeing a, you know, uh, really the the way business is done, switching from manufacturing and hardcore brick and mortars to services and other things, while we've seen house prices continue to escalate, mm -hmm. you know, that just means we have switched more of the property taxes onto the homeowner. So I'm looking at how do we expand the things that are sales tax exempt today. Um, there's $40 billion. We're going to look at about $6 billion of that. Right. And we're going to use that $6 so, billion. So eliminating exemptions. Eliminating exemptions. Okay. Uh, and there's a few loopholes. One of them is taking advantage of the Wayfair decision that the Supreme Court did. Um, that's going to generate roughly $500 million for the state of Texas over a biennium. You know, if we don't use that to reduce property taxes, we're growing the size of government. Sure. So I'm going to use it to, to reduce property taxes. Uh, so my bill does a 10 cent compression, goes from a dollar to 90 cents. That helps across the board for everybody. Uh, and then we give homeowners a 50 percent homestead exemption. Um, so what does that do? Because the, what's Com the current percentage? Uh, the current percentage is, well, right now it's a $25,000 max. Right. And so we allow that $25,000 to stay on and then give you 50% in addition to that $25,000. Um, that means percentage-wise that lower value homes get a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, average home value in the state of Texas is $274,000. Um, today they pay $26,000 on, based on a dollar four. Um, under my bill, they'd be at 94 cents. They'd get that extra 50% um, uh, homestead exemption. They'd be paying $1,200. That's $1,400 a year of savings to a homeowner. That's real savings. And that shifts us back to a consumption model, uh, which means sure. if you make more money, you consume more things, you're going to pay more taxes than that. Uh, the little, you know, the, the widow lady that is not out buying a whole bunch of stuff isn't paying a lot of taxes. Well, and that's always been my problem with the property tax is it does not reflect your ability to pay, right? And if I buy a 200000 home today mm -hmm. and I'm looking at what the tax burden is on that home today and then through appraisal creep or in, increased rates in the taxes, right. that continues to grow doesn't mean my paycheck's growing to accommodate that. No. I mean, you, you could run on hard times, had to change jobs, right. get paid less. You can still make the mortgage payment, or maybe you've already paid off the home. But that property tax bill continues <clears throat> to grow. Well, maybe what you really could do is, hey, I won't eat out as much where I'm paying as much in sales tax, and I'm going to you know, go back to the grocery store, buy steaks and this, and your tax bill comes down mm -hmm. you know, from that regards. Well, 
as, as a freedom-loving Texan, it's always bothered me that you never truly own your property yeah. because you have to rent it from the government for yeah. the rest of your life. Yeah. You know, and that's sad. But anyway, off my soapbox. <laughs> so you and I share another, another passion, although I think you've given it up, unfortunately, and that's motorcycles. You, you being a Harley guy, me being an Indian guy. Uh-huh. So uh, you, were, you were telling me that when you gave up your motorcycle, you gave up your flair for skulls and, and, and crossbones, but you're bringing it back. I noticed, yeah, I did. I noticed that so tie. I've got a tie. You know, we're we're going to zoom in on that so yeah. the audience can get a real, and little bit of that anybody who's seen uh, this session, I, I've brought a whole display of, of skull and crossbones, be it pirate ties, the sugar the sugar skulls. Hey, and, and I got a lot of love from the Mount Caucus. They love that tie. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, look, I, I'm going with them all the time. It's my way of giving back. Somebody goes, well, why did you give up the Harley? And it says, you know, it's, it's tough to talk to the constituents over my 25,000 square miles while I'm riding, a, riding on the motorcycle versus in the car. So I do it from that standpoint. That's true. That's true. But, you know, I keep my, my Indian scout out in Fredericksburg, and there is nothing more therapeutic for me on a Sunday yeah. afternoon than to go jump on that bike and drive yeah. through the hill country. Yeah. So, uh, wind therapy is what we call it. That's exactly that's right. Exactly that's right. exactly yeah. right. Well, uh, Chairman Springer, I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, As you know, uh, Mm -hmm. we like to end each episode with a quote from our guests. Sometimes it's a song lyric, sometimes it's a Bible verse, sometimes it's your own brilliance (laughs) that you want to share with our audience. Yeah, that won't be happening for me. So, so. (laughs) what what, did you bring for us? Enlighten us, please. You know, I was talking with my wife and trying to figure out, okay, so which one really is me? And, and, and we talked about a couple different ones, but I sort of came back to my own and, and, and it's really, I think it was a, it was a song that was played at our wedding and it is a song that has covered me through an awful lot of my life. And it's amazing grace. Mm-hmm. And, um, the words have so much meaning to me because I sort of fell out of the church mm-hmm. and got away. Um, I converted to Catholicism, um, after 17 years of marriage, I finally became a Catholic in 2008 yeah. and had given up some of my issues and that. And, you know, and, and so when the words talk about, you know, finding grace again and, and that, it just it just means so much to me. And, to, and I think that, you know, we, we all have our inner demons that we struggle with. And, That's right. and that one really is. I mean, it, it touches home for me. Well, I think it touches home for all of us uh, Christians, because sometimes it's really hard to believe uh, that He would love us enough to forgive us mm-hmm. in all of our many, many, many <laughs> imperfections. That is correct. And it's only through His grace uh, uh, that, that we have that. So mm-hmm. I love that song. It's an incredible song. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for coming on the show. My uh, pleasure. I, I always you, I enjoy you, listening to him. Well, thank you, and I hope you come back soon. All right, thanks. All right, thank you, sir. And thank you all for watching and listening to The Trey Blocker Show. You can find us at TreyBlockerShow.com, YouTube, and your favorite podcast app. Thank you, and God bless. This has been The Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And visit TreyBlockerShow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.